I am, I am Olivia Gardner, uh, the Education Policy Director at Advocates uh, at Arkansas Advocates for Children and Families, which coordinates the Arkansas Kids Count Coalition, um, which is a membership group of associations and individuals around the state dedicated to raising awareness about policy issues impacting children and their families, as well as teaching people how to advocate. If you're not already a member, we hope that you will consider joining. Um, I did want to let you guys know um, that we are recording um, this uh, discussion tonight um, so that folks can you know, watch it um, at a later time. Um, so just, uh, just, to, um, just to let you guys all know that. Um, and we wanna hear from all of you about your thoughts on where early childhood education stands because of the pandemic, the impacts you've seen and the direction that you would like early education to take moving forward. Um, we've invited a few guests to help us kick off the discussion before we open up things in the second half of the town hall. So I'm pleased to welcome um, James Hollywood, the Community Partnership Manager at Arkansas Early Learning, um, Kelly Summers, an educator at EOA of Washington County Head Start, PJ Yarborough with the University of Arkansas, and Elizabeth Roman, Administrative Assistant for Child Care Aware of Northwest Arkansas, and also a parent of a first grader. Um, I think this evening we will talk about a lot of challenges that children, parents, and guardians, and educators face while navigating um, the early child education, or navigating early childhood education during the pandemic, um, which is, uh, as everyone knows, still very much ongoing. But I wanted to talk. I wanted to start by asking the four of you. Have there been any positive surprises? I know it's kind of a hard question, but uh, trying to find the silver linings here. <laughs> uh, myself, definitely being in the classroom, um, working, you know, hands-on with children. I've seen some positive things that have happened since um, teaching in a pandemic. One thing that's really happened for preschool students is we saw so much less childhood illness last year in our classroom, not COVID related, but um, you know, usually we have at least once a year, we have maybe a flu case or a little bit of strep or something like that. We did not see almost no, no illnesses in our students just due to extra sanitization you know, procedures um, and things like that. That was one of the big ones for me. Um, but another another one that was really big is that we saw in our agency this really big increase in mental health services for families, for the students that we serve. We saw so, so much more emphasis being put into what we're doing to address the mental health issues for a lot of our families that come from, you know, um, very difficult family situations, life situations. Thank you, Kelly. Those are two great, um, great positives. Um, anyone else have another uh, positive of the pandemic? Yes, um, I'd like to add that I think that one of the surprises or positives is that we all learn new ways to connect. And uh, especially in the work that I do when we provide professional development, I train online and I had never done that before. And although I miss doing face-to-face -face as often as I did, the early childhood providers that I'm able to connect with now and train literally all over the state has really been a positive because we've been able to, to, to actually be in the room with people who we would never meet uh, and have the opportunity to learn alongside. I also will say that that has unleashed in, I believe, all of us. And I'll talk a little bit more on this when I answer another question later, but I think it's really unleashed our creativity and increased empathy overall for, for all of us. Great, thank you, PJ. Anyone else? I'd like to add to it, Miss Olivia. Thank you guys for the opportunity for being here this afternoon. Um, one of the positives that uh, we have been able to see is the power through partnerships. As um, you are aware, that I'm the community partnership manager for Arkansas Early Learning, and so we have been able to capitalize, been able to um, be able to partner with other uh, churches, nonprofits, other Head Start agencies, and other people that's doing stuff inside the community. So that is a positive uh, movement, something that we haven't seen um, in 
Uh, I mean, we see it on a local level where to see things, uh, to be able to understand what the, our needs are in our communities and seeing people step up to the plate to be able to address those needs. Absolutely, thank you for that. Um, Emily, uh, Elizabeth, do you have any thoughts before we move on to an, another question? Yes, so first off, thank you for having me. <laughs> um, what I'd like to add was when my daughter started at the Arkansas Arts Academy here in Rogers, she, um, I was so worried about the mask mandate and they actually made it really helpful and encouraging. Um, and her going right into a big elementary school made it so much easier for her, like the transition for her to understand, okay, this is the new normal kind of thing. She didn't know any different. Um, the school did very well with like closing weeks at a time or, or days at a time, just so they can do the sanitation and cleaning and ensure that the students are in a clean environment during the pandemic. Great, absolutely. Well, thank you um, all for um, helping me come up with some silver linings. Um, and uh, I'd like to ask a few of you, or I'd like to ask each of you a question as well. Um, James, how are your Head Start centers adapting to safely meet the critical health, education, and nutrition needs of their children and families? Education, health, and nutrition. First, let me start off by um, first about the uh, safety. Uh, as as um, under the Arkansas Head Start um, uh, minimal uh, licensing requirements and uh, Head Start program performance standards, um, we'd like to ensure that our kids are safe and our staff are safe within the facilities. So um, we immediately uh, begin once we, uh, AEL really never, um, Arkansas Early Learning really never shut down during the pandemic because we understood like the basic principles of the Head Start Foundation. And that was keeping things sanitized and clean and making ensuring that the uh, kids wash their hands and staff wash their hands and different things like that. So we, ne we never uh, lacked those type of regulations from day one. Uh, some things that we did do uh, with some of the funding that we did receive from the federal government and we are thankful for it. We have uh, took care our children, our families, and our staff. And so we understood the whole approach that was really important to be able to include all of those elements, but most importantly, the community as well. And so what we have been able to do with some of the funding to be able to keep our, um, our staff and our children safe, we had, um, we bought these COVID um, sheds to be able to uh, stop the children before they come into the centers to be able to do their temp checks. We hired security. Uh, as the security be able to do those temp checks. So those, um, those uh, we were able to employ other people that was outside our agency, uh, those that was um, at home or on deployment due to job loss and different things like that. So we was able to employ them to be able to do temp checks on these children before they came in, therapists and any other visitor that came in on campus. And so um, we also offer with this last round of funding with the American um, Rescue Plan, we offer uh, incentives for staff to be able to um, receive the vaccine. For those that received the vaccine, they was able to receive a uh, stipend for as funding and they was able to um, offer, uh, offer some PTO days and then some other benefits that was able to come along with some of those funding along with some hazardous pay um, to be able to take care of the staff. When it came to the children and the family's needs, we were able to address those through product donations and being able to uh, utilize some of those other funding, some of those other revenue screens that we weren't able to receive from the federal government to be able to um, help the children and families through uh, other partnerships in the community that we can be able to purchase at low cost. When it came down to the, um, the, the, the health, the health played into the same factor with the safety. Well, when it came down to uh, nutrition in uh, 2020, when we was when we did close down for a few months, we was able to um, help um, those families that needed food at home, as we understood that um, a lot of kids inside of the um, that we do serve are in impoverished conditions and they do not have the best of life, and sometimes they have don't have a safe environment 
um, that they um, normally would have at a facility like ours. And so we understood that um, we wanted to be able to take care of those children by sending foods and food and meal homes to those kids by partnering with our local food bank and other entities inside of the state. So um, we understood um, that one in four children inside the state of Arkansas um, are in desperate need of hunger. And we was already moving towards a one in four initiative because we were teaching our children about gardens and different things like that, how to eat healthy. And so we was able to um, supply food and milk and formula and different things like that to the children in need. And we all continue to do so today. When it comes down to uh, that's, uh, that ties into nutrition. So uh, for us, our parents, we, uh, we, we empower our parents to be able to be advocates for the children. And we also empower our parents to uh, workshops and different things like that through our family service department. And we understand those things are essential because education is important. And we understand that um, a lot of our families don't have the information or the lack of the information. And so we like to empower our families to be able to have uh, equip the skills or central knowledge and different things that they need so we can continue on to be able to fight. And most importantly, we always have our ears open so we can be able to understand what our parents are needing because we work on them on an individual basis and not just a holistic standpoint. And so those are some of the things that we have done at um, Arkansas Early Learner when it came down to the health, uh, nutrition, uh, and um, some of those other needs that we have seen in our Head Start facilities. Thank you so much, James. It sounds like um, you guys have done quite a, quite a great job um, adapting and thank you for adding in safety. I think that's an important um, thing to add in. Um, so I wanna uh, ask a, another question to, um, to you, Kelly, as an educator, um, what are some of the biggest issues that, you, that you're facing um, as a result of the pandemic? Um, well, we all know educators are magic and we can handle any kind of change. <laughs> Of course, um, but, of course. <laughs> but the changes that came with COVID-19 were pretty big, were pretty big. And the, the thing that really throws us off in the classroom is, is that, you know, CDC guidelines, um, you know, are constantly changing. We still have to meet our National Head Start, you know, performance standards. Uh, we still have to meet the needs of our families. Um, so, so sometimes that can be complicated because we have to modify activities to, still be able to be safe, but to meet the educational as well as um, social emotional needs of the students in our classroom. Um, I've got lots more I can list off too. Um, another problem that we have seen is that we had a, we had a problem with low enrollment um, last year, especially. We're still seeing some of that this year with not our classes not being fully enrolled due to um, uh, parents' fear of, you know, is this a safe environment for my child? Um, we have had, you know, some parents who registered late once they kind of saw that, um, you know, oh, my friend's family attended and, you know, she just raved about how, how you're keeping her children safe, that kind of thing. So dealing with low enrollment is really hard because that can cause us to lose some funding if we're not showing that we need, you know, need those slots for the students. Um, another thing that was really hard too is that we had a lot more absences due to families quarantining or um, classrooms being closed down for a week here or a week there or days here to clean um, or just to keep everybody safe. When there's a closure like that, it's hard on the families and it's really hard getting back into your routine, keeping those classroom routines. We know with the students that we work with, routine, routine, routine. We want to be a stable environment. We want to do things in the same way <laughs> every day. We want to be that safe place for the families. So when you're here a week, out a week, here a week, out a week, it's really hard to establish those routines that are so important for young minds. You know, three to five is, is the age group that I work with, and it's very important. Um, so that was a struggle to constantly make sure that we are keeping those routines in place and coming back, bouncing back as quickly as possible if students have been out or we've had to close a classroom. Um, some other things that, that we ran across um, that I think my agency handled really well but it did have, did have some conflicts was we really were concerned with cross-contaminating across classrooms because we have a lot of siblings in younger early Head Start classrooms and then some in the pre-K Head Start classrooms. So one of the things that we did was is we tried to place siblings, family members, um, whether it be cousins, whoever is living together in the same facilities so that the cross-contamination amongst 
uh, other centers would be less. But then we also had, um, specifically in my classroom, as well as other classrooms I'm aware of, we had sibling sets who, you know, I had a, a student who was three and her sister who was five in my classroom. Typically, in a normal year, we would not want siblings to be in the same classroom. We just know as educators that it doesn't always meet the best needs of those of those two individuals and really seeing them as individuals and really letting them grow and explore and uh, really, you know, come into, come into themselves. So that was definitely a challenge for me in, in my classroom last year, having, having a sibling sets in there. Uh, but I mean, it's a challenge that you, that you work with and it, and it, it does help to reduce the cross contamination and the and the possibility of having to quarantine or, or close a classroom that kind of thing. Um, the other thing that was was really difficult, especially for pre K, is we do a lot of language activities, a lot of music activities. It's extremely hard to do almost any activity in pre K wearing a mask. It's extremely hard. So um, for some activities, uh, you know, I'd have to make sure that the students were distanced far enough away and just wear a face shield so that I could remove my mask in order for the students to really see my mouth moving, my tongue moving, you know, forming, forming those words, especially, you know, during music, rhyme, different things that we teach. It's, that's extremely difficult. Um, another thing that I ran across was um, when we're doing, you know, discipline and, and and kind of teaching rules in the classroom. A lot of times if a student can't see your mouth, they don't listen to you. So you find, I would find myself having to take it off and say, yes, that's right. You need to put those scissors down and then put the mask back on. So I know it, it seems kind of silly, but it's like, if they couldn't see your mouth directly, you're like, yes, I'm talking to you. It was like, you weren't even talking. So there was just, it was just some challenges to work out, work out with that. Um, my agency, provided each classroom with um, air purifiers. We try to wear, um, have the staff wear smocks if that's what they're comfortable wearing so that if a child does cough or sneeze on you, you can take off the smock rather than having to change out your shirt during the day. Um, my agency provides tons of masks for staff, parents, families, basically anybody who says, I want a mask, we're giving that, <laughs> we're giving masks. We you know, give out sanitizer, we, we give out anything that we possibly can. Um, a problem that I did run into when we were originally quarantined um, and the centers got shut down in March of 2020 was I had to really quickly think, how am I going to translate our curriculum into something that is easy for the parent to do at home with the child? Not necessarily what I would do in the classroom, but what it would be easy for them. They're already under enough stress as it is at home. They already have enough of their own life issues going on. What can I do to make it educational, meet the needs of the child, and not overwhelm the family? Something that is still engaging. That challenge, um, along with, I have to now, instead of, you know, I have children rotate through a center, so I might have to make a supply set of like four materials for the children to rotate through. In that case, I'm sending materials home. So I have to create a whole classroom set of materials for each individual family to send home. So, I mean, there's extra costs there to prepare these packets. Um, during that time, staff were not allowed in the building at the same time. So I would go work in the building, put some of the packets together, um, call my, my teacher assistant, let her know my portion was done. She would come and do her portion. And then we would divide, divide and conquer, basically. I'll deliver to these homes, you deliver to these homes. So it's just, it, it takes, it took a lot, a lot of work, but we, we got a great response from the families. Um, they communicated back with us, you know, through photos, through social media. We were allowed to have class Facebook pages once, um, once we were relying upon technology more. So some, th some good things did come out of that. Um, developing relationships with the families more outside of school, getting to see more of their home life through through pictures and things like that was really cool. I mean, I even had I even had some like FaceTime phone calls with a couple families. And I mean, like, that's just not something I would do in a normal year. Um, but but it's something we did. Uh, I recorded myself reading stories, our favorite classroom stories that we would do and sharing it to our class Facebook page so the students could still 
I don't know, kind of get a sense of like, oh yeah, that's Miss Kelly, yeah. <laughs> Not only that, but their siblings could participate as well and that kind of thing. But I also got to show my own children, like in my videos, like my own, my own little boy, like he's a preschooler too. So they got to see like, yeah, this is my son. He's having a meltdown right now. And this is what I'm going to do about it. So they got to see in real time, kind of like what I would do in that situation. So there are some good, good things that came out of it. Wow. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, that was really, uh, it was really great uh, to hear about um, all the challenges that you've faced throughout the year, but also some of the ways, uh, the solutions and the ways that you've tried to combat those, especially um, I had never even thought about the cross-contamination issue. So that was particularly interesting for me. Um, PJ, I want to ask you, um, can you talk about some of the ways that you've seen both educators and early childhood education centers innovate during the last year and a half? Yes, and um, now that I'm speaking again, I also want to appreciate you guys for having me this evening. Um, I am very much um, over here like being Kelly's amen corner, if you will. Uh, a lot of the things that she shared really hit on the things that I will highlight. I will certainly let you guys know that although I get the opportunity to talk to a lot of early educators and at one time had the opportunity to visit a lot of centers, obviously that didn't happen over the last about 17 months. Um, being connected through professional development opportunities, a few private groups and even the Arkansas Early Childhood Association, I decided to reach out to some friends and I decided that it would be important to reach out to those who are family homes, center-based, public school, private. I, I really wanted to hear from everybody. As I thought about what new methods, ideas, and services they have actually tried and really, I'll say, kind of tested out over this last um, year and a half, I, I was already pretty much aware of things they've done, but even more impressed when I received their responses. So I wanna start with um, them being very innovative and creative in reestablishing or refreshing the need for parents and caregivers to be a part of their child's education. And Kelly kind of hit on that when she said they came up with different activities for the families to do in the home. And I think that there are a lot of parents out there who are very involved in their child's education, but there are also those who do not understand the importance of that, but had that refresher this last year. Uh, they had the opportunity to become, as we many times say, um, their child's first teacher. And I, I, was, I was in that boat now very differently than our early educators. I had a junior in high school, but it was all new to me to really be dealing with him as often as I was every day and making sure that he had what he needed to be successful. And I find that our parents were very receptive to that and appreciative, I think, even more of our educators because they noticed uh, what it takes to keep children engaged and to actually facilitate their learning. Um, I saw so many different cute and funny videos and memes out there about when is school starting back and, um, you know, come help my help me because I don't know what I'm doing, you know, all kinds of things. But I believe that overall, parents and caregivers really did a great job and that's because our educators partnered with them. The second thing uh, along those same lines is I believe that the ability to develop those remote learning activities and staying connected, even when there was limited ed tech uh, very few resources were available to a lot of our families. I live in South Arkansas. I'm in El Dorado and I oftentimes remind people that El Dorado is 15 minutes from Louisiana. And as a matter of fact, if I go to Junction City, Arkansas and I drive through the traffic light, the one traffic light, I'm in Louisiana on the other side. And we have a lot of families and that includes teachers who don't have internet in their homes and they're in very rural areas where they were having to drive to local McDonald's even to sit in the parking lot to make sure that they could get connected, their children could get connected. And, and that is a part of that innovation, finding what it took to make sure that even though we were all remote and learning to navigate that, 
those uh, learning activities were able to actually happen. And I feel like um, families made it work. I know that there were pods of people at one time meeting in a local park where um, the moms were letting up the back of their SUVs and, and then sharing hot spots. Um, and I know that there were some child care providers who did the same thing. They wanted to make sure that their families were connected and that their children were receiving what they needed. Um, maybe my last thought about that, uh, I think we all had the initial fear of relationships being fractured due to the lack of um, social emotional connection with peers and educators and families. And, and it was hard and it was different for us not to be able to be together uh, with one another. And so I've heard and seen so many wonderful things uh, from our families and uh, our teachers getting through that, even though families were not able to go into the licensed child care facility, uh, families were able to be greeted outside individually, one by one. And I heard of one provider who even said the families would be lined up in their cars with the children hanging out of the windows saying, you know, good morning to their friends and, you know, waiting their turn to to be transitioned out of their car to the door and then into the facility. And so that just shows that, you know, although we were in the middle of something that was very, very discouraging, we found some encouragement. Um, I believe that in itself led to deeper connections and relationships. Um, families were able to get connected to the providers who had to find ways to do that. Again, Kelly mentioned having a private Facebook group. Um, another provider did say that she sent recordings every day to let parents know, hey, he's making it through it. Um, I remember her particularly sharing with her families the uh, book that UAMS came out with. I believe it was their prevention medicine department. My teacher wears a mask. And she recorded that, um, reading that book, and that was provided to a lot of our our facilities and providers across the state. And she said that, you know, that recording, her child would almost watch it almost daily, even, even when he wasn't at school, because it really made sense to understand that masks weren't scary, but they were for safety. And it even talked about the teacher smiling with her eyes. And I think it gave our parents a lot of language to use with their children and how to describe that. Um, when we think about some of our very younger children, those born in 19, those born in 20, can you imagine they've never seen people without masks? And so that was something that people needed help understanding. I'm so glad that places like UAMS and others have come up with those resources that have helped us to be able to get through this and try to do the best to make sure that this trauma, I believe, is what I'll call COVID in many ways, will be something that we all can find ways to get through. I think my final thing that I thought about is how it's been so important for um, a lot of our programs who have had that low enrollment to make some very hard decisions, but they've done it because they had no other choice. Whether it was families were afraid or families were becoming ill one after the other, many have dropped their numbers permanently. And although that has probably been something that is not financially great, I believe that it has increased their um, relationship, their connection, and even their care for children who are in their programs. So I uh, applaud all of our early childhood educators and our programs who have done an amazing job throughout the pandemic. And unfortunately, we're going to be doing it again, but I think that what it's gonna do is it's just gonna help us pull out all the stops and find even more that we can do to continue to make sure that these early years, those zero to five, zero to eight years, the most uh, important and impactful. Wow, well, thank you so much, PJ. Those were some um, truly fantastic innovations that you mentioned. Um, I want to turn it over to Elizabeth. Um, I know that you, are the parent of a first grader, but can you talk about the impact that early childhood education had on your child and how that personal experience may tie in with um, the early child education um, 
the, the ways that you hear um, from parents in your work about early childhood education um, during the pandemic? Um, going back to the mass, the mass was the huge thing. Um, it was very hard to adjust just for me personally, because I had this vision of uh, walking her to class and just her first day, even graduation, but everything was just um, switched over. Um, and I had to adjust to that, to just leaving her at the door and her going in by herself and everything like that. But um, even here at work, at work, um, we're all pretty much vaccinated. Some of us are here at the office. Some of us work from home, whatever safest for us to keep everybody safe here at the office. Um, at her school, they do temperature checks. They would um, communicate with us through an app, which made us feel so much reassuring that they were doing okay. Even starting this school year, at first the masks weren't mandated. Um, so they were just free to pick and choose if they were gonna wear one or not. Um, and now that they're going back to being mandated, it's just um, an adjustment for all the parents. I feel like that's a huge controversial thing for every parent. Not every parent is gonna be okay with it or not, but I feel like whatever keeps our children safe is they're already used to that normal, just in a bunch of cases weren't happening last year due to all the sanitation and how we would take breaks during the school year. And that helped greatly, especially um, doing virtual. Uh, most months, um, at least once, once a week every month, the teachers would say, hey, we're gonna have a virtual week. So um, they would give them an, a tablet to take home if nobody had um, something to use at home. And that was really helpful as well because that was one-on-one -on -one time that I got to spend with my daughter doing a certain activity. I remember we had like the snow days. Um, they would do, hey, go outside with your child and build a snowman and post a picture. Just really fun activities or cook a recipe, bake some cookies um, and counting. So they incorporated some educational with the activities as well as spending quality time. Because like Kelly said, all of us um, parents, we all struggle with, you know, time, whether we'll have time and we have our own things to do as well, as well as working, stuff that we do at the house. So it all just worked out. And I feel like if we follow the same as we did last year, uh, the cases won't be so greatly and all of us would be safer um, at work as well. Uh, we have helped providers by giving them um, air purifiers and a filtration to pick up here at the office. We are not open to the public yet, but they call or let us know we can deliver or they can come by and pick it up at a certain time, making an appointment. Um, we give out bags full of cleaning supplies, hand sanitizers, wipes, masks even. Um, we did a back to school event last week and that um, was pretty well, um, gave out some of those bags full of cleaning supplies. So we've just been trying to all just trying to find a new normal here. I understand that completely. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Elizabeth, um, for those comments. Um, I wanna now open up the discussion um, to all of you who are here with us this evening. So if you have questions or comments, please feel free to share them. Um, you can unmute yourself or type in the chat box. Um, and I see that we already um, have one question that's been put in the chat box. Um, but first, I want to point out um, thank you to, to Gina Dickey for putting the resource uh, for the link for My Teacher Wears a Mask, um, which I will be reading directly after this, um, this uh, town hall discussion is over. So thank you so much. Um, but I want to go back to, um, to Joshua Hayes' question. What are some food security and nutrition needs that you all have seen and uh, solutions that are still needed uh, still needed for, the, for that. 
anyone feel free to jump in um, and, and tackle that. I think one of the food security problems that we have seen with the families that we serve is that we get a lot of donations that are shelf stable items. And while that makes sense for delivery, for storing, for not having to deal with refrigeration issues, we saw a problem with some of our families saying, I don't have lunch meat. I don't, I don't have meat for my family. So something myself and some other staff members did is we would either, you know, pick it up ourselves if we, you know, if we were so inclined, or we would actually go to um, different places. We're so lucky here in Northwest Arkansas, you know, we have, you know, Tyson, George's, we had lots of different um, corporations. Uh, we had, you know, Sam's Furniture was giving out um, lots and lots of food. Um, we had uh, Jose's uh, restaurant was, was giving out, you know, milk, ice cream, like just so many different things. But a lot of our families that we serve don't have the transportation to go get those things. So I know my TA, I know other people, we would go ourselves and go wait in those lines to, to get those items. And then just as quickly as we could get them, we would, you know, try to get them out to the families. Uh, we're really lucky, you know, every year we get um, big, pretty big donations from, you know, uh, George's and, and Tyson of turkeys and like whole Thanksgiving dinners. Um, but this time it wasn't just Thanksgiving, <laughs> you know, it was, it was a little bit all year. And whenever we got something, we were giving it directly to the families. Um, so I would say we still have an issue with being able to get fresh foods for our families, um, fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, things like that. A lot of the, a lot of the resources that we have are, you know, canned vegetables, which is not ideal. Um, it's, it's better than nothing, but it's, it's still not ideal. So I would say that that's, that's one of the struggles we are still seeing in, within our agency and our community. I'll add that transportation has also been an issue here. And so we were so thankful for, I know our school district was able to have a food truck and they were mobile. And every couple of days they went to a different community or part of town, which allowed for families to walk to the food truck. And uh, the one thing that I think they found out very quickly is that this was not just to serve the children, but they were giving those meals um, prepared for the entire family, which brings me to, I think, the thing that has still been an issue, which is we might have enough to give to a family, one child or two children, but what about your really large families, families of six, seven, eight people? Are there any resources out there um, that will service the entire family? It's gonna be very difficult to take home one prepared meal when you have seven to eight individuals who need to eat. And so um, that's something that I did see um, our food truck that was traveling around our community be able to do. But in that being the case, they ran out of food quite quickly uh, most days uh, once they found out all oh, the entire family can receive a meal. So I would say there is still some food insecurity and uh, if anyone has resources they can share to help large families, I would certainly be interested uh, in knowing how we can direct them to that help. On top of what uh, Ms. Kelly and Ms. Uh, PJ have uh, said so far, uh, one of the things that we saw far as food and security um, uh, on top of what they have seen was uh, being able to prepare um, meals um, and being able to understand how to be able to uh, put together those recipes to be able to, be able to um, provide a uh, holistic um, nutritionist meal for them and their family. And so, and then um, they have already said some transportation issues. Well, that was one of the things that we ran across mm -hmm. and uh, the reasons that we cover in Northeast Central and Northwest Arkansas is that uh, helping them to be able to put together these recipes and to be able to understand that how to um, make this uh, food um, last and different things like that instead of wasting it. Thank you guys. Um, and I'm grateful to all of you for touching on that transportation component, which I know is a huge, um, huge, uh, com huge component of, of food insecurity in our state. Um, if you have questions or comments, you can uh, type them into the chat or just go ahead and unmute yourself. 
Um, and if not, I can follow up with some uh, additional questions as well. Um, but we'd love to hear from all of you as well. Uh, if no one else has some questions, I'd like to follow up on the answers that were given. Um, I'm, I'm Josh Hayes. I'm the manager for PepsiCo's Food for Good program here in Arkansas. I'm not, our warehouse is in Little Rock, but we deliver all over the state. And most of what we do is USDA reimbursable meals, whether it's the after school program or school lunch programs and that kind of thing. But we also do a backpack program here in Pulaski County schools uh, for about 12 schools that a church is funding where it's an entire day's worth of shelf stable meals in a bag. Uh, we also, our program out of Texas has what we call the direct meals program where if a school is gonna be down for a week, but the school still wants to have the school lunch for those kids, we can put seven shelf stable meals in a box and mail it directly to the kids um, and that sort of thing, like the homes. Um, but basically our, our program, we're part of the foundation. So we're a, a social enterprise. We're not trying to turn a profit, but if you're working with a nonprofit or a community organization that has identified a food security need anywhere in Arkansas, they can reach out to me and I can try to help them see what we can do to overcome it. We operated a break-even business model. And I mean, I've got deliveries that go to Bentonville, Cross at McGee, Hot Springs, et cetera. So like some of those needs that y'all described are things that we can help with. And some of them are things that we might be able to innovate into um, and be willing to help out with. So just wanted to kind of share that. So. Thank you so much. Um, that sounds like a great potential resource. Um, we'd love to learn more about that. Um, uh, uh, anyone else have other? Uh, yeah, um, uh, Joshua, if you could put your, um, your contact info in the chat or chat it to specific people, that would be very helpful. Um, and if anyone else has questions, feel free to unmute yourself or put that in the chat as well. Hi there. I'm Dot Brown in Hot Springs, and I am associated with a church, a faith-based child care program. The biggest, and this is, you know, not, doesn't have any it's not publicly funded in any way except getting some of the things. But my question, is anybody else having trouble finding staff? Because our center is having tremendous problems. And what's happening is people are calling, they're making, they're making a, a, you know, a, arrangements to come in for an interview. Sometimes they come in, sometimes they don't. You never hear from them again, they come in they fill out the application, you give them the information, and they, are, of course, have to give a, get a drug test and things like that. Most of them are not ever coming back, or they will go through orientation and don't show up the next day. And this is really creating a real problem because you have to maintain staff-child ratio at all times, it also means you might have some staff members that you would like to move on to someplace else or find another career, but you can't get rid of those people because you've got to have them for the staff child ratio. And that is really, uh, it's, it's a real hardship on our program. We serve, I think, 80 something children from six weeks through five. Uh, and right now, at least 50 of them are have child care assistance or, or vouchers because so many are uh, necessary workers in the community. So every time I talk with the director, she said, I just, and she will try to call some of the people who don't show. Uh, they don't, obviously, they're not answering their phone. And of course, what I say is, if that's who they are, you probably don't want them but that doesn't help the situation. And I didn't know if anybody else, like I say, this is a, a faith-based program. Um, if anybody else is having that issue and how, how can we, how can I help her know some strategies for being able to get qualified staff? Miss Dot, you're speaking to me. <laughs> now, what? Um, yeah, I said you're speaking to me, Miss Dot. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so, the program. 
we have seen a really big problem. So this year I have transitioned out of the classroom and into a, a, an assistant center director position. So I'm seeing more behind the scenes how things kind of operate and work. And it's really interesting to see we are having a huge problem hiring staff and getting them to actually show up to the first day of work. <laughs> so one of the things um, we're working on is a new recruitment process, um, trying to hit a different a different set of people trying to hit other people who maybe hadn't thought of working in childcare before. Um, one thing we are getting more of lately is college students who are interested in education. Um, that can be really difficult for us and it's not always reliable because they're scheduling for classes. The other thing we've been having a little bit more luck with lately is the parents of our students. Um, they're already a little invested in the program because their child attends. We're seeing that they, they, they care enough, they're interested enough to show up, which is step one for us. But then step two is they see if they actually, you know, show up and come to work, they actually start to see what we're really doing. And then it just kind of spreads from there. They're actually seeing, you know, the kinds of things we're dealing with in the classroom and what we're actually, we're actually, you know, helping their, their child with and other people's children with. So I would say definitely try to reach out to your parent base and see see what you can get. If I um bear with that, my two cents. This um this has been an issue uh, prior to COVID. Um, it is definitely a policy issue right now. Um, we dealt with uh, the minimum wage increase in Arkansas, mm -hmm. and then on top of that, we deal with this pandemic. And then now we're wrestling against unemployment. Uh, it's definitely a policy issue where um, I say it's, it's, it's bigger than just uh, what we're doing on a local level. It's because if you can, um, a lot of parents, I mean, not a lot of parents, a lot of staff are leaving the job just because they can bear to draw uh, more money from unemployment because the demands and the requirements and the stipulations are so high for them and the stress levels are so high on the uh on the on the on the level of um, um child care it's really become a, a problematic issue and now that we're seeing that the pandemic unemployment is becoming um uh, it's coming back up and they be able to draw more benefits um and be able to find some type of job that's going to be able to help uh meet their needs and to help satisfy them and different things like that because we got to remember our staff is also dealing with mental health as well so it's definitely a policy issue that we're dealing with in Arkansas as far as like um, this unemployment, um, this unemployment type phenomenon and minimum wage increase. People think they deserve more pay than what they are paid. So it's it been an issue before COVID, but it has been a lot more of a bigger issue now here lately. So that's just the two cents just from being able to visit with governor and other policy leaders in the state. Well, uh, thank you guys. I, I know that's a very important issue that uh, impacts pretty much every center across the state. Um, so I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, and uh, I want to before we're going to we're coming up on our time in about 10 minutes, but I want to make sure I get a, a couple of uh, other questions in. Um, I, I definitely want to ask um, what are um, or rather, how do you think the pandemic may have impacted equity in early childhood education for students with disabilities, um, students from families with low incomes or black, indigenous or students of color? That is for anyone. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll throw it because I'm in the food security scene. I know before the pandemic, the numbers were showing about 27% of kids were in food insecure households in Arkansas compared to the national average of 22. And some of the numbers that are coming in say that that may have gone up somewhere between eight and 12%. So we're looking at well over more than one out of three kids now, uh, maybe approaching two out of five in some areas. Um, so I, I don't see how, I mean, if it's getting that much worse just on the food side, it's gotta be affecting every other aspect of life because food security is really just kind of a symptom of a lot of other bigger issues and in, in, in different realms and whatnot. So. Yeah, 
I suppose I can speak a little on the problem with um, some of my students who need special education services, um, therapy services. It, I have seen an impact on the reduction of access to those services. So sometimes the, ch the child wasn't able to go in person to receive different, different therapies that were needed. They would have to do it through a Zoom. And as you know, a pre-K child on a Zoom is not ideal. Um, it's, it's not the same as working in person with the child. So that, that has impacted some of the students um, who were in my classroom. The other, the other portion that has impacted them, and I'm still seeing that as I see my group of kids go off to kindergarten, their parents are very concerned with, will my child's special needs be met once they go to public school? Will my child, you know, who has sensory processing disorder, will he be tackled and forced to wear a mask when he goes to kindergarten? Um, these are just realistic concerns for some of some of my families who, who yes, you know, do value the safety of their child and others and staff and teachers, but who are also concerned that the needs of their, their children will be met. And Kelly, I'll add to that. I think that as we think about equity overall, when it comes to education, there are, again, so many families who, although the school district might have provided a Chromebook or some other type of device, once they got home, they didn't have internet to be able to even use that device. I believe that we also have a disparity in some of our homes of parents and individuals who are caregiving uh, those to those or caregivers to those children who, who don't know about technology, who are even um, reluctant to, to even learn about, you know, why would that teacher want to have access to my home through this Zoom? Um, I think that a lot of cultural barriers were in place that people were not aware of. Um, some children who were being required to turn their camera on when mom, dad, grandmother, or whomever they're living with said, no, you're not showing them the inside of our house. Um, I think that we, in, in that, that reality, uh, we have to shift our thinking and change our practices and ultimately begin to remove some policies and systems that create those barriers and keep our children from all being included in whatever is needed to make them successful in their educational journey. And so um, those would be my, my very brief thoughts, although this has been like one of my uh, hot spots and, and my buttons and my uh, things that I'm really trying to become well-versed in as I realize uh, so many of our, our children and our families are being kind of left on the side of the road, if you will, because uh, they just don't have the same resources available to them that others do. Yes, thank you, PJ. I would definitely. Just oh, I'm just sorry. Please share. go ahead, James. Go ahead. Just to share a little bit, it has polarized us. It has divided us a lot more further um, because those that do have the resources are able to advantage a lot more further than those that don't. And um, um, it's, it really, they really doesn't matter if it's an urban or rural community because we send it in in both and it's really um um in some of our poor school districts that don't receive a lot of funding from the state so it's really um has divided things a lot more further and showed us our greatest needs for education got it thank you i i uh, really appreciate all those thoughts i wanted to make sure we we definitely touched on equity this evening i think it's a really important thing that we have to consider um, if anyone else has other questions, um, please uh, continue to put them in the chat or please uh, go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, seeing none, I will ask another question uh, myself. Um, uh, let's see. Um, how would um, how would you guys like to see any new uh, federal or state funding um, used to benefit early childhood education? Um, there's a lot of new dollars coming in, and I think it's important that we um, uh, advocate, you know, use our voices to advocate for for what we are, what changes we want to see, and how these dollars can be most effectively spent. So, if anyone has 
ideas, um, we would love to hear from you. A higher like raise and pay for providers. Um, even just like the distributing of um, meals in school. Um, so it can apply to everyone. Um, so there could be more of a equality there as well. Especially during this pandemic, we really need um, just free lunches, free breakfast for the kids in school. Yes, thank you, Elizabeth. Any, anyone else want to add to that? Yes, um, I would like to just point out that, you know, with the increased stressfulness of COVID and, and living in a time with, with dealing with so many changes and things, um, you know, there is an increase in, in child abuse and neglect, and, and we see that in a lot of our families that we serve. So something that is, that is concerning to me is I know my agency um, just lost a bit of funding for um, a special classroom that we, that we have that is specifically for victims of crime. So we, we are seeing a loss of really necessary slots for some of our, some of our students to be in who are dealing with um, really problematic situations, you know, be it, you know, incarceration, homelessness, um, domestic violence, uh, you know, foster care situations, we, we are seeing a huge increase in need. And it's not only in those classrooms that are specifically created to, to serve those families, we're seeing it in all of the classrooms now. So I, I, that is something I really want to push for, more awareness, more funding for meeting these families' needs. Yes, I, I could not. I could not agree more, Kelly. I think those are all very vital um, resources that you mentioned um, that we need to see um, to see advocated for. Um, PJ, you put in the chat that more dedicated funds for mental health services for children, families, and providers. I think that's also super critical as well. Um, if anyone else has thoughts on that issue um, or that question, uh, feel free to. Um, Put your response in the chat or um, unmute yourself as well. This is Dot again. I think that some of the child care aware programs are considering hiring someone for social emotional support for the pro for the child care centers in their area. If not, some agency, need, I mean, that needs to be something we do things for their, uh, you know, for educational things. But I think that often we neglect the most important thing, which is children's social and emotional development, because that's the foundation for everything that happens after that. So I think there needs to be more emphasis for money for that. I mean, children are going to learn the ABCs and how to count before they go to college. But how do they know, I mean, how do they feel that they are safe and secure in your programs? in their homes, in their communities. And I think, and you were, somebody was talking about what we call adverse childhood experiences. Someone who was just talking about that. I mean, we really need to help the staff and child care centers know how to work with the children and with the families because there's really not a lot that they understand or are getting in that area. So how do we help these children build resilience so that they can they can be strong enough to combat or overcome what's happening to them uh, you know somebody mentioned the domestic violence in incarceration those are all real things what are we doing to help our child care staff be able to help our children in these areas and that's where i think some of our money needs to go just to add to what Ms. Uh, Dorothy said, um, it's important that we also stay in tune with our staff. A lot of our staff are also dealing with um, some trauma, some ACEs as well, um, as they, some of them are, they have children at home or dealing with their own trauma. And we all in this, uh, we have to remember we all in this together. 
And so we have to um, keep our foot on the ground about our children, our families, community, and our staff, and be more holistic in our approach and the upcoming policies that we uh, advocate for. Absolutely, I could not could not agree more with you, James. Um, well, I uh, want to thank all of you for joining us this evening. Um, it's been a great discussion and I thank everyone for attending. I thank our um, speakers for joining us as well. Um, and uh, if you um, uh, joined us tonight, uh, we will um, also be sending out um, an email after this and um, you can pass along the recording to other folks that uh, may be interested as well. Um, but I thank you guys again for joining all of us and uh, have a good rest of your evening.